Good morning. Let's do this. Today, we're going to talk about the standard template library. We'll go over some STL basics, some of the things that really make the STL powerful, our standardization, and some really good approaches that allow for generic programming techniques to really reuse some really nice, well-written code and make our lives easy once we understand the STL, how it's to be used, and then learn how to look up what it is we need to know how to do when we're using the STL. The STL, of course, is the standard template library. It's been included in C++, was greatly expanded in C++ 11. It's really well-documented, high-quality implementation of some really good containers, data structures, and algorithms, all of them that you can just include and then work. It's great that you can just include them. One of the things that we had to do in years past with library-based code is you had to link into a library where it was already pre-compiled. And this led to all kinds of challenges. Whereas now, because it's templated, it means that the code can't be generated ahead of time, which means that the code can't be compiled ahead of time. So the only way to get it to work is to include it in a header file, which is also good because you can look at it. I got to imagine that having access to this amount of code would have really made me a better programmer when I was first starting out. However, it's important to point out that this is library code. This is code that was written by a committee that worked together and the process of open source software that helped refine it and debug it and things like that. So it's not written in a great style that you would love to write code in and read code in. So there's the caveat. It is all there and available. It takes a little bit of use, a little, little bit of working on to get used to how it's written. And, and you, you know how that feels just when you see errors that come out of the STL. They have quite a bit of stuff and there's angle brackets everywhere and you start getting into underscore function names and things like that and underscore variables. But when you get past that, the actual algorithms that are being used by these functions, by these containers, are right there. You can see that. And with a little bit of work, you can translate a variable with a name that you would not you wouldn't generally use to something that makes sense and you can understand oh this is the counter that goes through each of the items this is where we get the capacity this is how this object checks its size or what have you so it's really good you can look at the stuff and you can answer a lot of your own questions a lot of times i'll get questions in office hours well should i use this or should i use that I say, well you can go look at the code and see what they're doing maybe that might help you clear up some things there so the STL is pretty powerful. It's got containers, of course, and iterators, which is one of the powers of the STL as it uses this iterator concept. <clears throat> There's memory allocators, which allow you to customize how memory gets used if you need to. For the purposes of 281, we won't get into memory allocators at all. Just the standard, uh, sort of the default memory allocators will be just as good as we need it to be for 281. There's utilities and function objects that are part of how the STL works. And there's, of course, algorithms that come in a number of libraries. Most importantly, just the one called algorithm. Include algorithm and you get a lot of good stuff there. There's some info here, of course, at Wikipedia about the STL. It's a great place to read. <clears throat> I'm a really big fan of Wikipedia in general for CS content. There's a lot of people in computers and stuff like that and somehow the CS content I don't know how it is for other disciplines but for CS for sure Wikipedia is great <clears throat> we've got some STL resources of course the C++ language by Bjarne Strustrup that's that book there with the mountain top that C++ book is written by the benevolent dictator for life Bjarne Strustrup created the language C++, still works on it every day to my knowledge, and is the 
sole or primary author of the book about C++. So you'll get some information there about the whole of the C++ language as well as the important parts um, in, in terms of using the STL is understanding how templates and templating works. That's in there as well. A uh, textbook that we used to use in this course, the standard C++, uh, C++ standard library, that's a tutorial and reference. We call that book Jesutis, named after its author. So you can see the C++ language book, which is often, just to clear it up, is referred to as Strustrup. Just call it by the author's last name. So there's Strustrup as the C++ book. The standard library book, uh, you see that it has on the cover there is nice C++11 there. So that was when we had the major expansion in the STL. So it starts there as we've gone into C++17 here. It's getting to be a bit long in the tooth. However, the fundamentals are there. The things that are most important to getting that stuff learned is completely covered in this book. Other places to learn stuff online, of course, CPP Reference and C++.com. Both of those have a really cool feature where they'll talk about a function or they'll talk about a container or a member, a member, uh, a member function in an object, and it will give you all of the things that are important about it. Tell you how to call it, tell you if there's multiple calling conventions, gives you a description of all of the parameters, return values. It even tells you what the complexity of this object or function is going to be. This is going to be linear, it's going to be amortized constant, it's going to be constant time or logarithmic. That's part of the specification of the STL. So you can get that information on CPP reference, which is a great way to make your decisions on what code to use. What do I have to do? What do I want the time complexity of that to be? And you can make some great decisions here where you say, well, should I use container A or container B? And it gets to, it depends. It always depends. Well, what does it depend on? Most of the time when you're trying to decide between two containers, it depends on what you're going to do with it. So when you look at the function you're going to use the most often, if it's exactly the same in both objects, then you have to go to another tiebreaker. You say, well, how do they work in memory? How about the function I use second most often? <laughs> Things like that. But you can go through each one of those functions and see what its, what its time complexity has to be. So at its heart, the STL is really just a specification. A specification of how a library has to be. So there's an STL implementation that's included with G++. There's an STL implementation that's included with Clang. If you're working in the uh, common language area, that's uh, what's the compiler that's on the Macs. There's a, an STL implementation that's done by Microsoft Visual Studio. So there are different implementations of this but all of them have to live up to the standard of the STL. So no matter how you do it, this function has to get X done in linear time or no worse than quadratic time, depending on whatever that algorithm is. That's what's described in the specification. So you can see all of that specification in a much more live and up-to-date version on CPP Reference and C++.com than you would find it in any textbook, I would imagine. So those are great references. And as they go over a particular function, it says it has to be done in such a way. And here's one way that it might be done. So they're not saying that they have the actual library implementation on the documentation site, but it's a cleaner version of it that's easy enough to read and is um, it is representative of what you might find in the actual library. So this is great because you can look at it. They also have this run this code or edit and run feature where there, there'll be a, a little sample program that says this is how it works. Shows you the program and shows you what the program's output is. But then if you click on it, there's a little button that takes you to an editor. So you can take that code itself and edit it and then run it again right in your browser, which is really good. I do that all the time when I'm trying to figure something out. Say, yeah, but I don't want to do that with a vector of integers. What if I did it with a vector of these zombies or a vector of these stock orders? Can I do that really quickly? And so you can bang something together in 15 or 20 seconds and give yourself a test to see, yeah, I think this is going to work for me. So that's what's great about those two sites. And like I said, they do have sort of really up-to-date versions of what's going on in all of these functions and, and objects. We've always got a couple of options. We can use someone else's code. 
or we can write our own. Libraries are obviously filled with other people's code, or you could write things on your own. There's pros, of course, to using libraries. A lot of things are hard to write, or, or they're hard to write really well. You can write them fairly easily, but to make them really efficient, it's hard to get done. So things like intro sort and red black trees are hard to write. Hash tables and merge sort are fairly easy to write, but to get them to be really, really screaming fast and still take care of that, that's kind of hard to do well. It's great when someone else does that for you. The other thing about a library, since it's planned ahead of time and worked on in concert, you end up with some uniformity. So you might not understand how a function works, but you know that it's from this library and so it's going to expect parameters in this order and it's going to be able to handle parameters like this. It's going to use iterators or something along those lines. So we got some real uniformity for our algorithms. Excuse me here. And that's brilliant for a library. The other thing that's really great about using a library is it's already been debugged by someone else. So if we look at the majority of our development time spent in testing and debugging, it was greater than 50% easily. If you've got code that you know doesn't have errors in it, not to say that your code that uses it might not have errors in it, but you've got a line in the sand, really, a line in the file system where you know that the bugs have to be in here and we know that the bugs don't happen once I pass it off to the container or once I send it to the algorithm, I know that if I send the right things, I'm going to get the right answer. And so all I have to debug is my code. And if I start to use the library like you really should, you use a library to do the majority of your work, then what you have to debug is the minority of the code. And that's pretty cool. So it can really reduce your debugging time. You've got these high quality libraries. The cons are that libraries are written by a group of people for everyone, generally. So they contain these general purpose implementations. And a lot of times you can write your own very specialized version because you know what things you don't have to check for. You have some other um, assumptions that you can make ahead of time that the general purpose code can't make. So you can write something a little bit faster sometimes in some certain situations. So you can specialize some code. You might be able to do some things as we'll see when we start working with gen perms. There's a version of next permutation that works in the STL, but it always goes through all the permutations, which isn't helpful when we're using gen perms in project four. In project four, we would like to see like, I've gotten part way down this generation of a permutation, and I see that it's not going, no matter what, anything after this start is never going to work, then I still have some k factorial things to check. I can ignore them in my own custom version, but libraries aren't made to be interrupted like that. So in the nth permutation, or the next permutation function from the STL, it's going to go through all those k factorial remaining problems that you know aren't any good because of the way things started. So there's some pros and cons to libraries, and we've shown that we will use things and we will write things in 281. So for instance, in project two, you're writing your own priority queues to get a good idea of how they work. But then when it comes time to writing our actual simulation code, you're going to use the STL version. I already mentioned the project four aspect of instead of using the STL code, we're going to write our own. So we've got to learn how to do this through the rest of our programming career, whether it's uh, the end of 281 or the next 40 years, you're going to be working in your own code and a combination of your own code and someone else's code. No one writes it all themselves anymore. The trade-offs, of course, is you have to understand this library. There's so much to it. That's what I mentioned earlier is you have to learn how to use it and you have to learn how to find things in it because much more often than not, you're going to have an idea that oh yeah, I know that there's a function that does something like that. Then you have to go look it up, figure out what the parameters are, make the call, and that's good. Or you say, I've got a container that I know kind of does what I want to, but i got to go double check on this particular function to see what I, what I think about the time complexity of it. Is that what I was really going for? So you're going to do a lot of looking up. You need to learn how to look things up in it. You have to know what's available, so having a high-level feeling for what's there is very important. And 
for this, I always suggest that you need to read a page of the STL every day. You don't have to read it with a fine tooth comb like you can't be tested on it. But if you scan a page of the STL every day and you go through a seven and a half week, maybe you have to read two pages a day in the summer, right? You go through seven and a half weeks and you've looked at a hundred different pages in the STL, not memorizing them, but having a good idea of what's there. You know what kind of containers there are. You know what types of algorithms there are. Then when you try to do something later, you can say, well, I bet that's a common enough activity. I bet that the STL supports that. And having a good way to figure out where it is, is important. We saw that picture of the library on the opening slide, and it's kind of like that. You don't know where everything is in the library. You certainly don't know what every book is, or by no means what every word is. But if I was to ask you to go find a quote from Dickens, you say, well, I have to figure out where fiction is. And once I get to the floor where fiction is, then I know where the group of shelves are and I can start to look at this in an alphabetical sense and I see where the D's are and I can get into that row and I can find Dickens like that and then you can look up the sentence that was the opening of whatever book it was. So this is how you would use the STL as well. So you have to get a good idea, you have to walk around the library a bit just to know what floor things are on, just to know what group of shelves things are on and then when it comes time to actually looking something up you can spend three or four seconds or you can spend two or three clicks and be right in the area where like now I need to read these 20 lines of text to see which one of these things I want and that's what's going to make you really powerful with a with a library you do need to know some of the algorithmic details that's what reading some of those pages is good for so understanding things like how does STL sort work this is something that we know now, if we've studied it, even just done a little bit of reading on it. That, well, the STL sort is implemented with this n log n worst case time. It's always going to be n log n, no worse. That's great. In practice, this is typically faster than quick sort. So, you know, I would use STL sort over quick sort, things like that. If you know something about a function like nth element, I'm not saying that you need to know about nth element in particular. This is just an example of how knowing algorithmic details is going to help you. I say well, if I'm trying to find this nth element, I can find that in average case linear time with that function. Whereas if I know that I got them sorted, I could find it myself without using the nth element. I could do that maybe in logarithmic time. So we've got some options there as we start learning what's in this library. Another example here down at the bottom. It says in the older STL, linked lists did not store their size. So that's just a detail to know. When you were using the linked list back then, you say, if I needed to know the size, then I would have to calculate at that in linear time because the list didn't store its size. The only way to ask a linked list what its size was is to start at the beginning and that function would next, 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 till it got to the end and count those nexts and tell you how many items were in the linked list. The newer version has the size in there as a separate member so that now if you're using a linked list, you can get its size in constant time. These are a list of some of the features that the STL relies on. It uses bool a lot. Let's just see if this works. See if this thing is available in there. Do something and return true or false whether or not it got done. Bool is used quite a bit. It, used, it uses const correctness and const casting on a regular basis. This is great for speed. I mentioned pipelining yesterday about how when, uh, when the the, the compiler knows that this might not be changed, it can set this code up to be executed in a pipeline fashion so that it can just go just a little bit faster. And the STL is really, 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 really important to the STL to be fast. And so things are done really uh, with the, the, the thought of speed in mind almost all the time. One of the common things you might ask about something, when you see two things, or two, two particular options are like, why did they choose this option over that option? Nine times out of ten, the answer is because this option was faster. So the STL is really um, looking at that speed. It uses namespaces as well. Everything in the STL is in the standard namespace. So you can include those things, obviously, with an include statement. But then to access them, you need to make sure that you're in a namespace. So you can do that with using namespace uh, standard. Or you can put a using statement there um, to, to get an actual 
thing out of the STL and make that something recognizable. Once I've included vector, I still have to refer to it as standard colon colon vector unless I put one of these two statements in there, using namespace standard or using standard colon colon vector. Once I've got that, then I can just declare something as vector. <clears throat> of course, templates, that's what the T in STL is all about. There are inline functions in there. It does exception handling. There's ex implicit initialization. All of these things that the STL gets right and does well for us is great. It uses operator overloading quite reliably, and that's a powerful thing for us, as well as um, an extended syntax for new and how things get created. Some keywords that we will be using later, explicit and mutable down at the bottom. So explicit is good to make sure that things don't happen implicitly that you don't want to happen. So one of the one of the style points that gets complained about by the auto grader is if you write a constructor for a class that takes a single argument, that needs to be declared as explicit. It doesn't need to be declared as explicit, but it's better to declare it as explicit so that we don't get implicit type conversions that we weren't expecting. Mutable can also be helpful for us when we're working in project two here. And what mutable does is it overrides const. Which sounds like a bad idea. Why did we have const if we were going to override it? But oftentimes we have some aspect of an object or some aspect of our data that we want to be protected, that we want to be const. But other aspects of it that we don't care about those things being changed. So for instance, if you have something in a priority queue, you don't want its priority to be changeable. So when you get that back as a const reference to that object, that priority cannot be changed. However, if you have something else that doesn't affect its priority, for instance, the number of shares does not protect, does not uh, affect a stock order's priority, if the number of shares was mutable, then even as I've got a constant reference to an order, I can still change the number of shares. And that's a really powerful thing there that would allow you to keep something in a container that is you know, based upon priority. So as long as we can't monkey with the priority, we can't break the priority queue. But we can still say, I've got an order that gets partially filled. I don't want to have to pop this thing out of the container, change it, and push it back in. Because popping it costs me log in. Pushing it back in costs me log in as well. Whereas if I could just grab a const reference to it and have a mutable member and change it in constant time, I'm saving time and effort. So these are some of the things that the STL uses. Learn about them. If you don't understand them, we don't have to go into a whole lot about exception handling, but it is available to us using the STL. This is some explanation, of course, about explicit and mutable. I just covered that about how the keyword explicit should be used with one parameter constructors and a mutable member variable can be modified even by a const member function. So that's great. Yesterday we talked about doing a copy by using pointers. And you see a small thumbnail of that code down at the bottom where we had that double S pointer that was pointing to a source array and a double D pointer that was pointing to a destination array. And then instead of using a for loop, we used a while loop that was doing a pointer comparison. While the pointer hadn't reached a certain location, then it used a couple of pointers to move some things around. So that's what's going on there in lines 10 and 11. And what that was an example of was a setup for generic programming. And I said this at the time, I said, here we've got it with pointers in 7 through 11, but with generic programming, anything that would behave that way could also be used. So what is this behavior I'm talking about? Well, in line 10, I've got a comparison of S pointer to source R plus psi. So I need to be able to compare these pointers, which I can compare pointers. I need to be able to dereference these pointers, which I did in 11, to dereference D pointer to write there and to dereference S pointer to read from there. I also need to be able to increment these things. And so I've got an increment on D pointer in line 11 and an increment on S pointer. So this is easy to use with pointers, but if anything else can be compared 
be dereferenced and be incremented, then this algorithm works for it, right? If I start templating things, I've got an algorithm here that works no matter what I'm doing as long as I've got something that responds this way. And how that is helpful is rather than having to write a version of copy that copies from one vector to another and write another version that copies from one deck pointer to another deck pointer or any thing like that. I have to write a, a version that goes from a list pointer to a list pointer. I write a copy like that. Well, then what happens when I want to write one that goes from a deck to a list? Do I have to write another version for that? Do I have to write a version that copies from vector to deck? Do I have to write a version that copies from deck to vector? I don't need to do that with generic programming because if I take an iterator into one of these things, an iterator responds this way. An iterator can be compared to another iterator. An iterator can be incremented. An iterator can be dereferenced. And those are the things that make this one piece of code over there generic enough to be used for any copy in the STL when I've got the right type of iterators. To be clear, there's numerous types of iterators and some iterators can't be compared, some iterators can't be incremented, some iterators can't, uh, I guess all iterators can be incremented, some, some iterators can't be dereferenced for write, some iterators can't be dereferenced for read, but if I use the right type of iterators and the STL does the work of providing the right types of iterators that I can then use this generic code. So if I want to do a sort, I don't have to have a sort function that knows how to sort vectors. And then another copy of the same code that knows how to sort decks. And another copy of the same code that knows how to sort lists. And another copy that sorts that. What I can do with generic programming is say, give me two iterators and I'll sort what's in between them. I don't care if that comes from this type of container or that type of container. So that's a really, really powerful technique in the STL. And because it works a lot like pointers, we can do C style stuff with the vast majority of what works in the STL as well, which is awesome. We can do C stuff and C++ stuff with the STL, and we can use the same algorithms that are written once, that are included once, and then they just work. They're debugged, they're fast, and they're available. This is amazing. I mentioned this earlier, I'm getting ahead of myself just having fun talking about the STL. Most of our STL implementations have the best possible big O complexity for what, they, what they're doing. So I talked about sort of uh, sort being a big O of n log n in the worst case. That's the best theoretical possible way we can sort is a big O of n log n. So the STL sort function running at that speed makes a lot of sense. Some of them have some surprising complexity. I talked about nth element. You think that if I could figure that out, something faster than... Uh, linear time, but it does have a linear average case time. So it kind of depends on what's going on in your data. If your data is sorted, you might be able to get to it faster. But if your data is unsorted, nth element still will get you that nth element in an average linear amount of time, which is pretty interesting to figure out how you might have to do it. So if I figure out how to sort them all, I see that takes me n log n time, and then I want to find the nth one, I could do that in some linear amount of time, but it still has to be n log n plus n, but somehow nth element gets it done in just linear average case time even if the data is unsorted so that's a pretty cool one to think about you may have to do a little bit of research there we'll talk about it if you need to um, go into depth about it but I would start looking at the nth element page just get an idea of how that's executed and you might learn something there some of our uh, STL objects uh, and functions might not have the greatest performance, but it's not because of the implementation. So I, I, I talked about yesterday. If you think you need a linked list in 281, you need to go back to the drawing board. And one of the reasons is, is even when that's done very well, it is inefficient, right? When we've got a really great implementation of a linked list, the problem is every time I need a new object, I have to do a new memory allocation. Every time I want to travel from one object to another, I might be jumping completely across from one side of memory to the other. There's no cache savings that I get by loading a bunch of things all at once. So um, that's important to recognize. 
that the SCL is doing the best it can, and if that's what's available and that's what you need, you take that, knowing that it's not going to get any better. It's just the way that it is. Because one of the main priorities in the STL is time performance. It's super hard to beat the STL in speed. When uh, Dr. P and I shared an office at the beginning of my time here at the U, uh, he used to sit on his side of the office and try to outprogram the STL. And most of the times, he would get to be some, write something as just as fast as the STL. Sometimes you can't even write something as fast as the STL without going through some pretty major, uh, some pretty major hurdles. But the only time he was ever really able to beat the STL was for speed was when he had some way that he could sort of specialize his code to cut something out. A really good example of that is when you're working on Project 4 and you're doing Euclidean distance. You're going to x squared plus y squared, you add those together, and you take the square root. You could use pow, pow x comma 2. That's a function that will raise x to the second power that gives you x squared. However, pow is a great function. It can do all kind of exponents. It can do fractional exponents. It can do negative exponents. It's got a whole lot more code than x times x. So a specialized version of x times x as opposed to the generalized version of pow x comma 2, the x times x is faster. There's one multiplication operation and no comparisons. Whereas if I've got a pow x to the 2, I've got to check to see if I've got a negative exponent. I've got to check to see if I've got a fractional exponent. I've got to do the work. And so you end up with something that's slower. So um, this is what I'm talking about in terms of Dr. P beating the STL. He could do this because he's a phenomenal programmer, but only when you've got an edge, and that edge is because you know something more that the STL doesn't know about what you're doing, and I referred to that earlier. So that's our coverage of the STL basic, more of this as we move forward, but there's things to point out that the STL is this amazing library that does so much for you. And to be able to use it well is about learning what's in it. You don't have to know everything, you don't have to memorize everything, that's not gonna happen. But if you're familiar with it, and you can very quickly look up something that you need. I look things up so fast on C++.com because I know roughly where it is where I want to go. And, you know, in four or five clicks and a scroll or two, I'm right exactly at the line or two that I'm looking to figure out, well, is this exactly what I wanted? And I go for it. So that's what I suggest doing some regular reading. You know, maybe take five minutes a day to work on the STL. And that means just looking through... Uh, a list of functions and then you read one or two of them and then you move on and that's all the STL work you need to do. Let's talk about containers and iterators in the STL. This is where we get a lot of our work done. All of our basic containers come in the STL. We've got vector and deck of course we've used those already in the 281. Stack and queue we've used their functionality. We probably haven't used any of them thus far, but we think of stack and queue as being adapters. They're really just uh, a way to take some previously written code. So this is a this is an inheritance thing. So stack and queue can inherit behavior from deck and they adapt a deck. So those are some basic containers. A bit vector is something that you could use here. That's really the same as a vector of booleans. And that's important because we think of each boolean as taking up a byte if I declare one. But if I take a vector of bools, there's a, a speed up there that the, the STL does for you. And that says, well, if I've got eight bools, they're really just one bit each. If I've got a vector of bools, I could get that done in one byte. I could use each bit out of that byte for a separate Boolean, which is much harder to do if I'm trying to declare my own member, if I'm declaring my own local variables. My own local variables, each bool takes a byte, but I could get 32 Booleans into four bytes if I was using a vector of bools. So that's a pretty cool thing that the STL does. We'll have set and multi-set. Also unordered versions of those, unordered set, unordered multi-set. We'll have map and multi-map, plus unordered versions there, unordered map and unordered multi-map. Um, the list we've talked about extensively already. Array is something that we haven't used much and probably won't. Array is very similar to the C style array, which is also kind of similar to the vector, but the vector has got a little bit more power. The vector is more flexible. It's dynamic in terms of its size and growth at runtime, whereas the C++ STL array is very similar to the C array in that I have to tell this thing, 
how big do I want this at compile time? And then it's locked in. So um, not a whole lot of use for the array when a vector wouldn't work. As we look at some linked list containers, I, I mentioned them before. I just want to point out just some of the things that you would learn as you learned about the STL. List, that's one we see all the time. Standard list, that's a doubly linked list. There's also S list, which is a singly linked list. And there's another type of linked list called a forward list. And we don't have to know this stuff. This is just some general background information, a type of thing that you learn when you sort of peruse and study a library. So if you include S list and use that, it does use smart pointers. And in the general course of programming, smart pointers are not a thing to be concerned about. But the autograder has been keyed to not accept smart pointers. So if you include something or declare a, an S list in some of your code that's submitted to the autograder, it's going to get rejected because we're putting smart pointers as something that you can learn later. We want you to learn how to really use dumb pointers. When you're smart enough to use a dumb pointer, then you're smart enough to use a smart pointer. I guess that's the way we feel about it. Uh, on the far column over there, we see that just calculating the size of one of these things varies depending on the library specification. So a doubly linked list from the STL is specified that you have to calculate its size in constant time. So that's got to mean that there's a member there that's holding that count. Every time you add something to the linked list, it's incremented. Every time you remove something, it's decremented. But then you can access it in constant time. In the S list, you can implement that as slowly as linear if you like. Now, that doesn't mean that a library implementation can't implement it in constant time if they choose, but it has to be, at the very least, linear time. And then for a container like a forward list, uh, there's not even a, a way to calculate the size of the forward list. So understanding what you've got going on is really important to learning what to use and how to use it in the STL. I mentioned iterators earlier in, in my talk about generic programming, and iterators do some generalizing. They generalize pointers. They work much like pointers do. And they allow us to write code that's based in iterators, but then that same algorithm can be used on multiple data structures. I don't have to write a version of this sort or a, a version of this search for vectors. I can write a version that just handles ranges, and those ranges can be a vector range, a deck range, a list range, and it still works. Right? The, the, the iterator concept is that sequential access where I can start at the beginning and go next and go next and go next and work my way through the entire container. And this even works in unordered containers. You can work your way through an unordered map with an iterator by going to the next thing. So that doesn't give you things in an order that you would expect, but it will go through all of the data. That's how iterators work there. Iterators help write faster code for traversals as well. We talked about syntactic sugar and what happens when I actually square bracket. We saw a square bracket function where we're taking that base address, we're adding the offset, and then dereferencing. So if I square bracket, I've got a base address, I've got an addition, and then I've got a, a dereference. So there's two operations there. Whereas if I've got an iterator, and that iterator is actually pointing at the thing I want to dereference, dereferencing the iterator is just literally getting the memory there. And then as I increment that, now it's pointing exactly at the thing I want to see next. So if you're trying to do traversals, iterators are faster than index-based for loops. That's just a small thing here. So we see something down here where I've got a generic print function. And this is a great example about this generic programming here. I've got some input iterator that I'm passing in as my two parameters, where to start printing, where to end printing. And looking at this code, say, well, this code would work with anything that responds with the ability to compare, begin does not equal end, that's in line four, the ability to dereference, and the ability to increment. That's both happening in line five there, where we got dereference, begin, plus, plus. So we read that value, and then we move past it to the next value, all in that line. So this piece of code here, with, will work with anything that behaves that way. So it will work with C-style pointers, because C-style pointers can be compared, dereferenced, and incremented. 
vector iterators can be compared, dereferenced, and iterated, uh, incremented, uh, and so on. So this is a generic function, and this is what is important about some of the ways that the, the STL uses its approach. You'll be doing some more with iterators in lab. Here's a high level to understand some of <clears throat> the ways that iterators get used in the STL. There's different classes of iterators, so you don't actually ask for an iterator. It gets, <clears throat> it gets given to you by the compiler based on what the compiler sees you're going to do with it. Or sometimes the object itself is limited to giving a type of iterator. So input iterators are exactly what they sound like. Therefore, getting data. They allow us to read values and they move forward as I get some input. I work my way through a stream or a file or things like that. So input iterators can be incremented because they need to be able to move forward. They can be compared to see when to stop. Is this iterator equal to the last? Am I at the end? So I just stop iterating. They can be dereferenced. You can't do multiple passes with an input iterator, which should make sense if you think about an input iterator could be tied to a file. So as you read from a file, there might not be a way to rewind that file. If you're reading from a file, you can sometimes move back in the file. What if you're taking input from a keyboard? You can't rewind keyboard input. So input iterators don't allow multiple passes. You can't even say, well, I'm going to, I just read this one with the iterator. I'm going to make a copy of this iterator and use it later doesn't work. So we have to make a pass here with an input iterator. Output iterators work similar to input iterators in that they can use that forward movement and they do the writing. So reading with inputs, writing with outputs. That's great. No multiple passes or copies. Again, that makes good sense. But now there's something that's a little bit less functional that you might be concerned about. When I'm doing output, I can increment and dereference to write, but I can't compare which often doesn't really cause me any problem. As you figure out I'm writing a file out, there's no need to concern with checking to see if I'm at the end because if I wrote it and it's the end and all I can do is increment and write, then I know that the output iterator is already at the end. And most of the time, I don't have to check to see if I've written it all by checking my output. I can check that with my input. So my input iterators can be compared my output iterators cannot even be compared. You can't take two output iterators and compare them and get any reasonable information there. A forward iterator is kind of a combination of input output iterator. It allows us to read and write with forward movement. But now, in addition to being able to increment, compare, and dereference, we can also store the iterator's value. So up here with input and output iterators, we couldn't take one along the line and say, I like that one, I'm going to save it for later. You can't do that with input output iterators, but with forward iterators, you can. A bidirectional iterator is just like a forward iterator, but it can also be decremented. And that's pretty interesting when I'm needed to move backwards through a container. A random iterator sounds like the random access that it provides. It's just like a bidirectional iterator in the fact that it can be read, written, incremented, compared, dereferenced, it can be decremented, but you can also do pointer arithmetic with a random iterator. Say, I want to take this thing that I'm looking at with the iterator and then add 7 to that. And I can jump over 7 spaces in a constant time. Or I want to subtract 15 from that and jump backwards. So random iterators allow us to do that. A reverse iterator is an adapter on either a random iterator or a bidirectional iterator. And the difference between a bidirectional iterator is I can plus plus to move this way, I can minus minus to move that way. Whereas a reverse iterator, I can plus plus to move that way. So I can plus plus to move from the end to the beginning. Whereas with a bidirectional iterator, I can plus plus to move from the beginning to the end. I can minus minus to move from the end back to the beginning. But if we think about the way that our generic algorithms get written, they're generally written with plus plus in mind. So when I work through this container, I'm going to plus plus my iterator from the beginning of the range to the end of the range. What happens when I want to produce, when I want, when I want to work with something in reverse order? Well, I could have another copy of that algorithm that was written in minus minus, but that seems like a lot more work than making a specialized iterator 
that just says, well, when I plus plus, instead of moving forward, I move backwards. I can still cover a range that way. And then I can use the same generic function over and over again, whether I'm passing from left to right with a plus plus, or if I'm passing from right to left with a plus plus by using a reverse iterator. So there's more about this at cppreference.com slash iterators.html. Good reading there, understanding about what's going on there. As I mentioned, we'll be doing some work in lab with iterators some more. All the, SDL, all the SDL containers that support iterators support begin and end. Let me get the beginning of this range and the end of this range. They also have a couple other versions. There's C begin, which is give me an iterator that starts at the beginning, but is a constant iterator. It's going to give me uh, a, a reference to something that I am not going to be able to change, right? We talked about reverse iterators. Those are uh, retrieved with R begin and R end. Those will give us iterators that as I plus plus, I move from right to left as, a, as opposed to moving from left to right. So both begin and end and C begin and C end will give me plus plus moving from left to right, like reading of English text. But begin is a, a sort of general purpose iterator. C begin gives me a constant iterator. R begin gives me a reverse iterator. And there's also one that's, and I always have to look this up, which is something you do sometimes. There's a combination reverse constant iterator, and I think it's RC begin. I don't think it's CR begin, but I, I always have to check to make sure. So RC begin will give me a reverse constant iterator. So now as I plus plus, I'm moving from right to left, and I can't modify what I've been given. One thing that's very, very fundamentally important about iterators and ranges in the STL is that begin, that's an iterator, that points to the first item in the range, the first item in the container, if you will. If I ask this container to give me your first item, I can get an iterator to that by calling begin. When I call end, however, I will not be pointing at the last one. The STL uses what's known as a half open interval. So we use a square bracket on the left and a round parenthesis on the right, if you remember how math works. So in that square bracket, that means I'm hitting that thing. And with the parenthesis, I'm going up to but not including the thing. So end is exclusive. The thing or the location that end returns to me when I call end on a range to, to get the end for a range of data is not something that I can dereference. You can never dereference end. You can never compare a value at end because end is always pointing just past good data. You can compare an iterator to end, but you cannot compare the value at that iterator to the value at end. So we use begin as inclusive, it's pointing at good data, and end as exclusive, it's pointing one past good data. So that's how the STL does all of its work, and we'll be doing that in our slides as well to get you used to it, but it's important. Since, S, uh, since C++14, uh, some more was added to the STL. We got standard begin, standard end, and standard C begin, standard R begin, all of those things. So these are functions here that are library level and are not container level. And what they do is if that container implements begin, the library level function calls the containers function. Great. So now I can always just say begin parenthesis vector, whereas before I said vector dot begin. I can call begin parenthesis vector or begin parenthesis deck, or I can even call begin parenthesis C style pointer. And what that does is it gives me an iterator that has wrapped that C style pointer. So I can use C++ uh, STL calls with C style arrays and it looks like regular C++, C++ code. So that's pretty nice there. Um, most of our slides have been converted over to use the begin call as opposed to the begin member function. If you see one though, let us know. We'll probably change it. STL operates on iterator ranges, not containers. That's what's fundamental. The STL does not have functions based on containers because then it would have to have a function written for every type of container. <clears throat> and it would have to have multiple functions written for pairs of containers. So the STL always operates on ranges. You get a begin, you get an end, you can send that off to a sort or a binary search or whatever you want to do there. The great news about that is a range can do 
all of a container or it can do part of a container in a way that's pretty easily specifiable. So if I had a function that just sorted vectors, you say, well, I wanted to sort a vector, but only the second half of a vector, I'd have a real challenge if I had to pass it a vector, and then I have to have some additional parameters say, well, start here, and there's other comparisons and stuff there. Whereas with, with iterator ranges, I say, well, if you find where you want me to start sorting and you find where you want me to stop sorting, I can get that done for you just by calling standard sort. So that's great. Um, the, the thing about iterator ranges is they don't need random access, unlike indices. So they're using that iterator tradition of being sequentially accessible, plus, 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 plus. And we mentioned earlier that you do get faster traversal with iterators than with indices. Here's some quick examples of copying and sorting. This is since C++11. So we've got a vector included here in line one and an algorithm the algorithm library is included in line two. We use namespace standard three so that anything in those two includes will be readily available to us. I've got a const n of size 100. And then I've got this main that declares a vector of 100 negative ones in line seven and an array of integers in line eight, C style array. So we'll call the vector V and we'll call the array A. Both of them have room for 100 integers. In this loop, in lines 10 and 11, what we do there is just go through something. This just generates some random-ish data. It's not a really good random function. All it is is if we take j from 0 up to 100, and we cube j and mod it by 100 so that it stays less than 100. But those numbers, uh, they're not sorted by any. So you think of um, the way that things get going as we start cubing things. 40 cubed, and then we mod that by... Uh, N and we get down there so what we end up with is V filled with some disorganized data so we can use these functions here from 12 to 16 this is just some examples of using STL copy for instance so STL copy takes two iterators for the range where the data is the begin and the end and so you see here we've got a vector dot begin and a vector dot end. We can call that in C++14 with begin of V and end of V. And then we need a place to copy it to. That's the third parameter of copy. And that third parameter has to be an output iterator or something that behaves like an output iterator. Has to be something that we can write to and we can increment. Well, it turns out that an A pointer is something I can do that with. <clears throat> I can pass in the C style pointer in A and do a copy from the vector to the C array using the STL's copy. I can in line 13 do a copy from a C style array to an STL vector. Just by saying I want to start at A, go to A plus N, that makes it look like an STL range because A is pointing at good data and A plus N is pointing just past good data. If there's 100 items, I would be looking at index 100, which we know to be out of bounds. If there's 100 items, I can use indexes 0 to 99, but not 100. So if I get to 100, I should stop there. So that gives me a good range. Here, there's a line 14 is a call to sort on a C style array. There's a call to sort in line 15 on a vector. <clears throat> All of these things. In line 16, this is just a little tricky thing that you can do here. This is a declaration. It's a variable declaration. It declares a vector named reversed. And it does that by passing in two iterators to give it a range of data to copy into that vector. Those two iterators are reverse iterators on V. So if we've sorted V here in 15, what gets stuck in reversed is a reversed sorted version because this creation of a vector with two iterators means that the data between the iterators will be copied to the new vector. Right? So the, the third parameter in the copy function, that's the output. We're starting from the first parameter, going to the second parameter, and writing all of those things in between there to data starting at the third parameter. All right, so that's what it looks like in C++11. Here's that same slide in 14 plus style. So you see that all of our begins and ends have been turned into the function calls as opposed to the member functions. This all works just as well. This is a nice, cleaner, more consistent look, however. You see that our C-style pointers can be wrapped in begins. 
We can wrap a C style pointer in an end, just like we can wrap a vector in a begin or an end. Here, our, our, our begin works that way as well. So the only difference between these two slides, the uh, previous and this one, is that we don't use the member functions anymore. Now we're going to use the library level functions. We got to be careful about not using iterators. Sometimes when we try to write templated code, we have to make sure that we do this in a way that is easily distinguishable by the compiler. So we don't want to have ambiguous code there. And we, you say, well, I, I want to write a generic, a generic function kind of like the STL does. But instead of using iterator ranges, I'll just say, I'm going to genericize this on the container. So here the templated object is the container. And that doesn't end up being something that the, the compiler can always distinguish, right? This is going to give you some compiler errors due to ambiguity here. You see here that just because we declared this template thing to be a container, it doesn't mean that it is a container. It just means that's the name I chose as the template class. So it could be something else. And if we get down here and we're like looking at something that's a declared of this type container and see it might not respond well to begin or end. If it doesn't, then we can't quite get there. There's a might be a different way that it's implemented in one container or another. So we can't do it this way. We have to do what the STL does, which is template on the type, not on the container. The type of data in the container, not on the container itself. So there's a couple of versions here. Um, there's a const version, and we can see one using the the, the range-based for loop on the far side, and this one's using a while loop over here. But these are not going to work because they are ambiguous. We have to do this in a way that allows us to template on the data type, not on the container. This is a version of doing that here. Here you see that the template is on T here, the thing that's in the container. And so this now, if I'm trying to write some overloaded operator insertion operator stream insertion operator now i can say well i'm going to do this on a vector so now i can just pass a vector to this to the c out c out hyphen uh, c out less than less than vector and it's just have it printed that's great but what i've done as generic here is the type of data in the vector i can't genericize the vector itself i can't genericize the container i can only genericize what's in there and then i write a specific one that handles vectors so now if I want one that does decks, I've got to write a separate version for deck. I've got to write a separate version for list and so on. But that's the way that it has to work. If you're not going to use ranges, and you want to use this on containers. This code will compile without the ambiguities. You just have to write multiple versions. Memory allocation and initialization. Initializing elements of a container. Talk about containers of pointers. Talk about behind the scenes. Memory allocation. All of this is done for us by the STL. Now. This is something that it's unfortunate we haven't gotten to until now. We've already had project one come and go. But look at that line seven. Line seven allows me to declare and size a two dimensional vector all at once. I can't tell you how many times I've seen students declare a two dimensional vector and they just make an empty one. Then they resize the outer vector and then they run through a loop to resize each of the inner vectors. Takes a bunch of time, takes a bunch of code, and could easily be replaced and just as fast with this line seven down here. So I've got a vector of vector of int that is called two dim array. Then I've got two parameters. I've got the number of things that I want and the second parameter, which is optional, is what those things should be. So in this case, I've said I've got a two dim array of size 10, and each one of those 10 things is a vector of integers of size 20. And each one of those 20 things is a negative one. So this has given me, in one line, a 2D vector that is 10 by 20 and filled with negative ones. Far easier than writing the stuff that I see here in lines one through six. So in line one, we declared a two-dimensional vector that's at least long enough, but we have to make each one of those vectors actually worth something. They have to have some size in them, and that's what this for loop does in two and three. It goes through each one of those 10 vectors and makes them be a new vector of size 10. So it's important to recognize here that we've done a lot of vector creation. So in line one, we create 10 vectors, and then in line two, 
3, we create a vector, and we do that 10 times. So this version in line 1 through 3 creates 20 vectors. Creates 10, destroys them, and creates 10 more. Not optimal. This version down here in line 7 creates exactly the 10 that we need with the 20 items in them that we like. Another version, instead of creating the 10 vectors and then creating 10 more, you could use resize inside of a loop. That's what's going on here in lines 5 and 6. But very clear, very concise, very easy to read is the line 7 version. Do that. If you want to write a 3D version, you can do that as well. You just have to sort of extend what you've got there. You've got here a two-dimensional array, which is an array of one-dimensional arrays. If you want a three-dimensional array, that's just an array of two-dimensional arrays. You sort of wrap that line seven with another version of itself, and you can get out to as many dimensions as you like. Important to recognize how the vector works. We're going to use a lot of them understanding what it is. A vector is three pointers. That's what you get. When you declare a vector, you get three pointers. <laughs> Takes a constant amount of space all the time. However, those three pointers point off to the heap. They're a dynamic memory data structure. One of those pointers points to where the data begins, beginning of allocated memory. Another one points to the end of the allocated memory. And then there's one that's pointing to the used memory and these are STL kind of things so we're going to be pointing just past the allocated memory we went just past the used memory but this allows us to calculate the capacity of a vector meaning how much can I store in there if I need to and the size which is how much is currently in there so those two things can be different <clears throat> So it's important to recognize that every vector I declare has 24 bytes. Even dead empty with nothing in it, it's 24 bytes. So if I've got a million empty vectors, I've used 24 million bytes without putting anything in there. And this is important as we start working on multidimensional vectors, and we helped you along with this. We said always declare the number of colors first, then the rows, then the columns. The row column thing isn't that big a deal, but since we do print things out in row order across the row, it's important that we did the row so that we can access them that way. But the overhead that we saved by putting the number of colors first, because typically the number of colors is less than the number of rows, right? The number of colors has got a constant upper limit of 26. The number of rows, however, did not have that upper limit. So one really tricky test in there had 26 colors, 88,000 plus rows and 17 columns. So if I had done my vector declaration in the wrong order, right? So you think about the way that 26 vectors of size 88,000 by 17 is 26 outer vectors. There's 24 bytes per vector. There's 26 times 24 bytes, right? That's not a whole lot of memory. Now, if I had placed that 88,000 as my outside vector, so I've got this vector of rows, and in every row, I've got some vector of columns, and in every column, I've got what goes on in each one of those colors. Then I would have had 88,000 vectors times 24 bytes, and I have many more. So what you want to do is to order, when you've got the choice, you would like to order your indices in increasing order, right? So you like your smallest one to be first. You like your next largest one to be second. You like your third largest to be third. So we didn't do any sort of variable nature of that. So we didn't ask you to do that to make sure that you always declared your most efficient map. So you would have uh, maybe 17 vectors of size 88,000 would probably be the most efficient way to do it. But the, we wanted to make sure you got the colors right. So you can see here that if I take three pointers per vector, if I've got a 3D vector, I've got three pointers that point to the main vector. That's going to be a given. Then I've got three pointers for each one of the rows, or so each one of the floors in the 3D vector. Then I've got three pointers for each row in each floor. So that's where that 3 plus 3A plus 3AB tells me how many total pointers I have there. So you can see that if my largest dimension is C, the variability of my, the, the number of pointers used in overhead is minimized because I don't even use pointers based on C. I've got three pointers for the outer, 
three pointers for A and three pointers for A times B every row and every floor. So I don't have a, a pointer to deal with every column and every row and every floor. And so that's what we're talking about. You're trying to reorder the dimensions so you can reduce your overhead when possible. Now, it would have made things really, really, really crazy if we were talking about writing a version of our floors that could go XY versus YX. Um, so we didn't do that. But we did make sure that we got our floors done first because that was the constant value that was generally much smaller than the total number of rows or columns. And we did that on purpose because this is about reducing memory overhead. That's our discussion on STL containers and iterators. Make sure you understand how iterators work. Make sure you understand how iterator ranges work. There will be an STL question on the midterm exam and you will have to write an STL style function using iterators. Do some research. This is a little bit about functors and lambdas. This is a great way to make things happen. Many of our algorithms and containers take some sort of function to make that customizable. I talked about this when I mentioned the customizable container that is a priority queue. We need to pass that a function so that when it says, hey, I've got two things that I should put in this priority queue, how do I know as the STL which one you think is most important? I can't do that at the time that the STL writers are writing the library because you're going to come up with whatever you want as soon as those profs in, in, in 281 assign you something new. You've got to come up with your own new function object. So they write things that can take function objects or lambdas and then turn that into a customizable container or customizable algorithm. This allows us to do things like sort increasing versus sort decreasing. Um, have a priority queue that takes big items as important or have a priority queue that takes small items as important. Even though they're small, they're still at the top of the heap. How do we use a functor? So one way to do some sorting, if I've got a class of employees, I can overload operator less than. So then my sort operation can say, here's uh, an employee and here's another employee. This employee is less than that employee. Let's sort them accordingly. However, because I've overridden operator less than, it allows me only one way to sort those employees. So I can't say sort them by salary and sort them by seniority using the same operator less than. I can't sort them by department or whatever you want to like there. So the way that we do this is to write a function object. This is also called a functor. That's a nice way to refer to it. We've got a couple other ways that we refer to these functors. We'll talk about a predicate or a unary predicate. That's a functor or a function object that takes one argument and returns yes or no. We talk about a binary predicate, often called a comparator, which is just a functor, which is just a function object. But a comparator is a type of functor that takes two objects and returns yes or no based on how those things relate. So in this example, we're writing a comparator called sort by name. And what it has to do is have an object, that's the, the function object base of it. So here we've written it in a struct. You can write them in classes, it doesn't matter. An object is an object is an object is an object. <clears throat> this one's written as a struct because what's important about this function object is it has to have a public overloaded operator parentheses. This is the function part of the function object. So that public overloaded operator parentheses says when I get one of these objects, I can call this operator parentheses. I can call this function that is the object that is the function. <clears throat> so in this case, we've got a public operator parentheses. And since we're writing a comparator, it's going to take two parameters and it's also going to return a bool. That's what makes a comparator for us. And so we've got two employees going in and we can use that in place of an operator less than and it's going to behave like a less than it takes an employee on the left an employee on the right and what it should do is return true if the one on the left is less than the one on the right so if they are in the correct order already you've passed them in here and here if they're like that you return true if they should be like that return true if they should be sorted in the opposite order you pass them in like this and they should be reversed to get it right you have to return false Okay, so this one just looks at the left's name and returns the right's name. Is the left's name less than the right's name? So yeah, this is as a string comparison. And since the left's name shows up earlier in the dictionary than the right's name would, then we put that one first. And so this one returns true. So if we have sort of like Adam in left and Bridget in right, 
we would return true because the left name A should come before the B name. If I've got my left name is David and my right name is Cassandra, it should return false because D doesn't come before C and that's exactly what this does. What this allows me to do then is I can write any number of these functors. I can write one that sorts by name. I could write one that sorts by age. I could write one that sorts by salary or whatever. And then when I call the sort function, I say sort these things, but use this particular functor to make it happen. I want them sorted by name. So I'll sort begin to end. And then I add the third parameter in sort, which is use this functor to make that happen. <laughs> This leads me to an example here. This is a complex example. Be careful. This is a complex example, but is very relevant. What we're going to do here is what's known as an indirect sort. It's called an index sort. So I'm going to sort some data without moving the data. How do I do that? <coughs> I catch a bunch of indices that refer to where the data is, and then I sort those indices. So that's what the indirection is. As I travel through my sorted list, it's not data, it's indices of data. I travel through the sorted list and it tells me where to look in the actual data. That's what's going on there. So I can do this with a functor. And I'm going to do this with one that's now in a class because I've got a public operator parentheses there. This is going to work for me as a functor. It takes an I and a J, so it's looking like a comparator. It returns a bool, so this is a comparator. But what it compares is an I and a J, which in this case is two indices. So if I always look at index four, it always comes before index five. But I want to know what's in the data at index four. What's in index four might not necessarily come before what's in index five. So I need up here some way to reference the actual data. In line two, that's declared as a reference to a vector of doubles called coords. That reference to a vector of doubles then allows me to pass in two indices, and then you see the return value in eight doesn't compare i to j. It compares what's in coords at i to what's in coords at j. That's what's going on there. So now I can sort I can sort these things in my vector of doubles without moving the vector of doubles. But if I want to look at the sorted version of it, I have to travel through the list of indices, not through the data. Line 12 gives me those indices. That's 100 size Ts. Line 13 gives me those doubles. That's 100 doubles. We go through this loop here in 14 and 15, and what we do, 14, 15, 16, is we sort of just give us 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 in my indices, and then I go through my X coordinates and I generate some random looking doubles. All of them are less than a thousand, <clears throat> but they're randomly generated, so they're in any order that I want. And they're going to stay in that order because X chord will not be modified. When I create one of these sort by chord objects here in line 19, I declare it as a variable named SBX. SBX has a constructor up here from line 5 that says, give me a constant vector of doubles reference and you can store a copy of that reference and then when you need to use it you can you cannot change those doubles but you can at least look at them <coughs> so SBX is something that I can use to sort these X coordinates by index and that's what happens here in line 20 we've got a sort of index we're sorting the indices but that would be really simple. They're 0, 1, 3, 5, 6, 7. They're already sorted. But I don't want to sort them as indices. I want to sort them as references to data in coord, x coord. And that's what gets happens here when I pass in SBX as the third parameter. So the STL sort function takes two parameters by default. The beginning of the range, the end of the range. And it sorts all of those things in increasing order. As long as they can all respond to standard less. If I can look at them and say, well, 4 is less than 5... If I wanted to sort those things, a standard sort call would just be begin, and I'd be good. If I want to do a custom sort, where I'm passing in the comparator that says, this is how you sort a stock order, this is how you sort a pair of zombies, this is how you sort some X coordinates that you can't move, you have to pass in that third parameter to sort, so that it can customize that sort. And it uses that for all of the decisions, as it looks at two items in the sort. Should I put this one first or this one first? Well, I don't know. Ask the comparator. The comparator says, 
true, they're already good. Or the comparator says false, you need to swap them. All right. Um, you can fill a container with values. <clears throat> this is just a, a nifty aside. You can fill a container with values from beginning to end, starting at zero with iota, which I would have done on the previous slide here because we did fill index with zero to 100. But since there was already a loop that was being used, it was easy enough to just incorporate that in line 15 there. However, if I was just trying to fill a vector standalone by itself, it would be faster to use iota which is just an STL function that uses ranges and iterators to fill something with 0 to 1 to 2 to 3 to 4 all the way up to n minus 1. Whatever you pass in as that third parameter is where it starts. So if you want to start counting from 1 or you want to start counting from 1,000, you update that third parameter and it fills the range from beginning to end by incrementing by plus 1 every time. That's what IOTA does. Nifty little function. It's in numeric, include numeric. Lambdas are another way to get function objects. We talked about the heavyweight function objects that we looked at previously, the functors, the comparators. Those were classes. Those were structs that we declared ahead of time and made instances of. A lambda is a way to write a function object anonymously. So it doesn't have to exist as a class. I can write it kind of right in the place where I need it. So right where that third parameter is, instead of having some other object that I've declared earlier, right where that third parameter is, I can write a lambda right there that is the function that's going to be used. So a lambda, as it says here, is an anonymous function object that can be defined on the fly. Directly where you want to call it, you can just start writing it. What this does is it can improve code readability because now when I'm looking at some sort, I don't have to go look up, well, where's the functor that's making this sort happen? It's, it says something here and I got to go figure out what file that's in. Another way to do that is to use a lambda because the lambda puts the code right there in the space where that third parameter goes. So it can improve code readability that way by keeping your code local. You don't have to name a function. You don't have to do anything else. If you're only going to use this once, why make a whole object and a whole function to deal with it? We could just do this as a lambda. It's great. It can make a lot of STL algorithms easier to use. It's what's powerful about the STL algorithms is they're all customizable with a function object. And so learning how to use lambdas is great. You can use them as function arguments. You can make the callback functions with lambdas. They're really cool. It's a powerful technique. We don't go into teaching it very much in 281. This is our early forays into talking about it. So this is the anatomy of a lambda, how I put one together. I've got these three things. I've got a square brackets that surrounds a captures list. I've got a set of parentheses that surrounds a parameter list. And then I've got a curly brace set that surrounds the function body. <clears throat> the captures list allows me to write this function <clears throat> and include things in the scope, right? So inside of this function that I write, what if I want to use something from the current scope? That's what the captures list does. So I say I'm writing this anonymous function, but I want to be able to have that anonymous function access one of my local variables currently where I'm declaring the anonymous function. So you put that in the captures list. The parameter list, just like any normal function, this tells me how many parameters I've got, what types they are, and so on. There's also the function body, which is just like a function. This is where the things that you do happen. So we try not to write really, really long lambdas, but lambdas are great for something like if I'm looking at two employees, I can write a lambda that says, well, compare these two employees' names. Or I can write a separate lambda that says, well, compare these two employees' start dates really simply without having to go write some new object. And so that's where you really want to keep your function bodies and lambda short, just because otherwise, if it's going to be a whole lot of code, you might as well write the separate object. That actually increases the readability by saying, I've got this code somewhere else and I can use it when I need it. <clears throat> so here's my example down at the bottom. <clears throat> this is an example of a lambda with no capture. So I've got those two square brackets and they're empty. So I'm not bringing in anything from outside this function. The only thing available inside the function will be the things passed in in the parameter list, and that's int n1 and int n2. Inside of the function body, we see that we're taking the absolute value of n1 minus 2 to see if, that, uh, see if they're farther than 5 apart. So this returns the absolute value of n1 minus 2. Is that greater than 5? So this is a simple lambda that I pass two ints to, and it just tells me yes or no, they're farther than five apart. If they're farther than five apart, I get a true. If they're not, I get a false. So I could use that in any one of my STL functions. That's the way a lambda works. <clears throat> we also can note that lambdas will attempt to figure out what the return type is. So if I'm working on a bunch of uh, ints and I'm adding those ints together and I re 
return the sum of those two ints, it's going to be an int. The compiler knows that. If I say, oh, is this int greater than that int, the compiler knows that's returning a Boolean. I don't have to tell it so. However, if I were to do something like this function here, you see double x plus double y. If I return that as x plus y, it's going to be a double. If I wanted to make a lambda that returned this as an int, I can add a return type in there. And that kind of gets smashed in between the parameter list and the function body, kind of inverted to the way we think of function declarations. But we've got the capture list followed by the parameter list, followed by hyphen greater, and a return type that's optional I don't have to return I don't have to always include a return type it can be inferred most times from what's going on there but if it can't be inferred you include it to get what you like this is an example of a lambda here so we'll see that I've got a nice predicate up above here this is an is odd predicate it says I'm gonna give you a number you tell me yes or no if it's odd so it's a really simple predicate you could have done that yourself but this is an example of how to use functors and lambdas equivalently. So this one says, if this integer mod 2 is equal to 1, then this is an odd, and we're going to return true. So this is how I might write this in a full-on function object that I declare somewhere else. <clears throat> Down below here, in line 15, 14 and 15, we see the exact same call to find on begin and end of vector, and in line 11, we use the predicate declared up above, but in line 14, we declared a lambda in line there. And so we say we're going to give it an n, that's one of the integers, so it's important that what's being passed to this lambda is something in the range between begin and end. So this is a vector of integers, I'm going to get an integer. Then I just return n mod 2 is equal to 1, and line 14 and 15, well with the close on 16, do all of what 1 through 5 does along with 11. So this is why we talk about including readability because now I can see all of it happen here in these three lines instead of having it take place over six lines in two different locations. This slide talks about variable capture when I want to have some information here. So in this one I've got a vector declared in line 2 and I've got some factor, which is an int there. And what we're looking for is some number. That's what the C out and C in of lines 5 and 6 do. They say, give us a number between 1 and 25. And C in reads that into this variable named factor. Now, what's the goal here is to be able to use factor inside my lambda. So my lambda has, obviously, just like a function, it's got local variables and it's got parameters, but this isn't a parameter list that I can control. Because this is being called by the STL function find if, the STL function says, here's what you get as arguments. But if I want to be able to have something else that's customizable to that function, I need to include this in the captures list. So we've got square brackets factor that says, inside of this lambda, I want to be able to compare n to something from outside of this lambda, that factor value here. So in this case, we're doing a factor mod, uh, n mod factor, but factor comes from outside the lambda. And that's what a capture list is all about. It's about all the time we have to talk about lambdas. But if you need to know some more about them, they're a very powerful technique that can speed up your writing and simplify some of it. This talks about the ways that captures work because we can capture things by reference, we can capture things by value, and some combinations thereof. So that's what's going on there. <clears throat> this is a small exercise on Lambda exercise. Well, we've got a structure of me message objects. Each message stores a send time and a receive time. And what we want to do is be able to take a message and determine if any of them are uh, take too long. So if the, the sent time is too far away from the received time. And so that's this is message pass threshold function that's going on there. So we're going to take a whole vector of these messages and we want to return, was there any message that took too long? Well, message pass threshold is going to do that with any of... Well, you're going to make message pass threshold do this with any of, which is a function from the STL. Write it down, look it up. It's in algorithm. <clears throat> any of, and any of takes a range and a unary predicate, which you can write as a lambda. That's the exercise, and here is the solution. Take a gander at it. Pause it if you need to. 
here's the function message pass threshold. It calls any of, any of, uses a capture to inc include that threshold, and it also uses a lambda there to do the subtraction of sent from received in comparison to the threshold. So this is how it gets done. This is a, a way that you could also turn around and sort those things by using a, a, a similarly constructed lambda that manages received minus sent on two messages now so we can know how to put them in a proper order. That's functors, that's lambdas, that's what we have to talk about. Uh, after that, we've got some stuff on using the STL. I appreciate that we are about out of time here. So rather than making separate videos, I'm going to say those of you who have to move on to another class at this point should move on. But I'm going to keep going here and make this all one video and get this done. So we'll talk about using the STL here. This is a nice quote from Quora. If you ever have some free time that you want to just waste, go check out Quora. There's tons of stuff on there. And you'll end up looking up things that you don't really care about. But it seemed interesting at the time. There's a lot of good information on there. But it's like the internet in general. You can waste time like any rabbit hole you could fall down. But this question is, why is C++ so commonly used in programming competitions? Most of them now allow you to use Python, allow you to use Java. Um, some of them even allow you to use JavaScript. But the reason why C++ still continues to dominate the competitive programming scene is because of the STL. When you learn how to use the STL, it's got so many really nice, fast algorithms that are in there that you can write off with one line or one line with a functor or one line with a lambda, two, three lines maybe at max, and get a whole lot of work done. It's because of the STL. That's why the STL gets used so often. Or so why, why C++ gets used so often in, in top coder competitions because of the STL. We talked about how to learn it. There's online tutorials and examples. I talk. I use C++.com all the time. CppReference.com is equivalent. Uh, one of the things that's interesting is CppReference.com seems to be a much faster website than C++.com. However, I'm just in the habit of using C++.com. It's slower. Normally, looking the thing up isn't the bottleneck to my code, though, so I don't too, uh, don't, don't worry too much about it. You can practice all of these things with small programs, which is what's great about those online features of C++.com and CppReference.com. You can just do it right there in a the web browser. You don't have to break out your own code and stuff like that. Like, I just want to, I just want to see if I understand how to use this sort function with uh, an employee record. I can make a little simple employee record and try it. <clears throat> There's detailed coverage in a lot of books. <clears throat> There's also a card in the files resources location on Canvas, and it's called Algo List. And what it is, is it's just a list of the things from algorithm.com. So you should get that and read it. Just read it. It's a PDF. It's one page front and back. So you can scan that. I would scan that once a week for the next three or four weeks just to make sure you know what's in algorithm. Next time you want to do something in algorithm, it's probably already partially written in the STL. So if you know about it, you can use it. If you don't know about it, you spend time writing yourself. You spend time debugging yourself. And you don't have time to spend time. All right, I mentioned talking about using familiarity, lookup skill versus memorization. That's what's over there in the yellow box. It's better to know what's there and be able to look it up than to try to memorize it all. You're not going to manage to memorize the entire STL documentation. So daily, skim through there a little bit, pick a page, read the whole thing, call it a day. Move on to something else. But this is how you learn how to use a library, how to put these things together. So. And the green there at the bottom, it says the most valuable skill is knowing how to look things up. <clears throat> when we're debugging STL code, we're going to get compile errors. Usually, a compiler is going to complain about things um, that have to do with STL headers. And is going to be complaining about things that happened in STL headers. And you're like, well, it's the STL's problem. But it's really not. These induced, editor, these induced errors come from your code. So you have to follow back through the list of the compiler errors until you get to something that belongs to you, and that's where the problem is. That's generally where you've had a type issue. So double check your function signatures, and it's hard to read, but most of those compiler errors are saying, you tried to call this function with this object, and it needed to be that object, and there's no good way to convert from this to that. So there's a problem. We can't compile. 
if you figure out how to get that, sometimes four, sometimes 400 seems like line piece of error to make sense. The problem is the types. So go back, double check your function signatures and try to figure out what is saying is like this parameter one should have been of type this, but what is of type that? So then you can look in your code and say, well, did I really declare parameter one of the right type? And that's what is going to make you, it's going to help you get past most of your compile errors in the STL. When you're runtime debugging, we'll mostly get our crashes inside the STL. They won't come a lot of times in your code because your code is mostly just going to set things up and call the STL. But if the STL gets a bad setup, it's still going to cause an error. So I haven't had a student in 281 yet that's discovered an error in the STL, but I've had a lot of students that have had errors in their own code. So even if it looks like it's crashing in the STL, it's probably you. That's what I'm saying. It's not me, it's you. See what I'm saying? All right. <laughs> so when you're using a debugger, for instance, GDB, you can use where or backtrace, which is abbreviated by BT, that'll show you the stack trace. You can see uh, the stack in Xcode's debugger. You can see the stack in Visual Studio. If you haven't figured out where that stack is, you should look at it because when you're in the middle of debugging, you can jump to different places in the stack. So you can say, well, it's gone wrong here, but I thought it was better when I called it. And you don't have to start the debugger over again and try to stop things. You just jump back a stack frame and say, well, here's where it was called. Let's see what things look like in that frame. Let's see what happened in that context before it got called into this context. So use that, especially if you've got a crash in the STL. Like you can back up through this, the STL frames to get to your own stack frame. Say, well, now this is my function. This is where the setup went horribly wrong. This uh, highly unsubstantiated fact here in red says 90% of STL related crashes are due to users dangling pointers or references going out of scope. So it's unsubstantiated, but it's not qualitatively wrong. It might be quant quantitatively a little bit dodgy. But the truth remains that most of the problems happening in the STL crashes are because something happened poorly outside of the STL. Pointers or references gone bad. Um, there's stuff in there about randomization. Dr. P discussed how to do things with randomization here. I heard that in one thing. Hopefully uh, you've got some access to that. I believe it was a lecture. If it was office hours, um, We'll, we'll talk about it some more in office hours, but this just talks about some things that you should learn. Include the random library from the STL, and you can learn how to do random number gener generation. You can see in P2 random, the file that we gave you, how we use some random generators to make a bunch of stock orders based on a simple input. So you can use that to make your own data files for testing. It's a great it's a great concept to learn. So make sure that you learn how to use random number generation. It's very powerful because you can sit there and say, well, how can I think of all of the order cases? Well, I can think of this map and that map. And you get really, really, really into it. And you've thought of, you know, 10 maps, 15 maps. But then you write a random number generator and say, generate 15 million maps for me. What are the chances I'm going to find the edge case when I've got 15 maps? or when I've got 15 million maps. And if you learn how to do that random number generation and use it to your, your own effect, it would really be helpful. This is an example of using a random number generator. This one just fills a value with, a, a, fills a vector with a bunch of random values. And you can sort of look at this. This is great for testing. You, you write some data. Uh, this is really good. So you don't want to test, a lot of times you don't want to test things on a bunch of random numbers. Like, so when you're trying to figure out how do I know the median of these values? And you say, well, I'll just make some random number generator. I'll just throw a bunch of random numbers at it, but I don't know if I got the right answer. A better way to do that is to take a bunch of numbers that you know and then shuffle them randomly. And then you know what the answer should be, but hopefully if you send it in there 15 million different ways, you'll be able to find all of the different orderings that might make this problematical or good. All right, that's using the STL. We've got this last bit here that's STL container performance. And this is a group of slides that show how the containers that we use regularly perform relative to each other. I've got list and vector and deck 
and a pre-sized vector. That's what vector pre is there. Um, but what we do here is we talk about what's going to happen here. We fill an empty container with a bunch of values, and then that's it. So each one of these slides shows this, and this is some stats on the machines that were used back when this was uh, taken care of. Um, machines are faster now, but the, per, the behavior isn't directly changed. <clears throat> So the vector pre uses resize ahead of time, so it's a single allocation, whereas all we're doing is a bunch of pushes with all the rest of these things. And you can see here in the graph that that list is linear for the more stuff that we did. They're all linear, but relatively a lot closer to constant when we look at the vector deck and vector pre compared to the list, which is almost uh, oh, one slope going straight up there. This is another version that says, let's fill the container with a bunch of numbers, shuffle them at random, and then search for each value using standard find. So we see here that the deck and the vector still remain really effective. List, however, not so effective. Trying to do that shuffle, trying to do that find, not nearly as fast. This version finally gives list a chance to shine. Right? Fill the container with numbers 0 through n, shuffle at random, then pick a random position by linear search, and insert a thousand values. We expect the linked list to go fast here, and it does. What we expect to be really painful is the vector, because when we insert a bunch of values at the beginning, we've got to shift a bunch of values over. So that's what's going on there. Across the bottom is the total number of elements in the list before the insertion, and then the the vertical axis is how long that took in milliseconds in time. All right. This is another one where the list shines. We see that it's almost constant. It does barely move from zero. But that's because we've gone to a place and we can just delete those items. We delete those thousand items and we never have to shift anything. Whereas when we get to 100,000 items in a vector, when we delete something from the beginning and we have to shift 100,000 items over, to, to, to fill in that space, it can take quite a bit of time. So that's what these are. We can see here a vector taking a beating versus list and deck. It's hard to even see deck. Deck and list happen at the exact same speed, so the red and blue are overlapping, and you can't even see the blue there. Um, but this is inserting a bunch of new values at the beginning of a container. Inefficient with a vector, great with decks, great with lists. This is how uh, and these slides are the way that you make decisions on what you want to do with a container. What am I going to be doing? Am I going to be inserting things? Am I going to be finding things? Am I going to be shuffling things? Am I going to be deleting things? What am I going to be doing the most? Find the container that is most efficient at doing what I need to do the most. Now, what I need to do the most is get some lunch. Have a good one. See you soon.